Welcome to Communicast, a communication skills podcast. I'm Scott D'Amico, president of Communispond. Today I'm talking with Jason Lyons. Jason has spent 25 years in communications-centric roles, ranging from journalist to sales manager to senior vice president managing business units across multiple global regions. He is currently helping companies improve the way they train their frontline workers on the essential technologies required to keep America moving through his role at Skillful. Check out the episode to hear Jason discuss why 90% of communication is 100% forgettable and how to ensure your communications are indeed memorable. I hope you enjoy. Jason, thank you so much for joining me today. Tell you what, to to kick things off, let me just tell a little bit about yourself, your background, and what you're working on today. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Good to talk to you. We go back a ways, and it's great to see the the great things you're doing at Communispond. So thank you for the conversation today. Um, So I have been in communication roles my entire career. Uh, Got a degree in it, got started very, very young, had a real passion for uh, kind of media and communications as a young professional, even a college student. I was a a news writer, sports writer. I was on the radio. Some would say I have a face for radio um, and, uh, you know, had a chance to really practice my written and verbal communication skills in a pretty public setting at a pretty young age and then have moved into roles in public relations, sales, management. <clears throat> Scott and I intersected uh, in the higher ed sector a good decade or so ago. And so really my entire career, I've, I've leaned on my written and verbal communication skills, use them every day. It's probably uh, I don't do much well, but it's probably one of the things I do pretty well and uh, excited for this conversation. What I do today is I work with a technology company. I live in Dallas, Texas. Uh, it's a company called Skillful, S-K-Y-L-L-F-U-L. And my communication skills are coming in very handy because we're sort of disrupting and creating a market segment within technology <coughs> to support frontline workers um, who are kind of a forgotten but essential worker population here in this country, particularly as we record this, you know, amid COVID, um, they're keeping our shelves stocked and keeping things moving and transporting us and transporting materials and keeping the power lines up and things like that. So have a real passion for that and uh, excited to, to support them, improve the way they use technology on those front lines. So that's what I do today. Uh, and spent 15 years in kind of higher ed uh, management, corporate learning roles, uh, as you know well, uh, and a few other things. So yeah, excited for this conversation because communication skills has been something that, again, I lean on every hour of every day to do my job well. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, we, we go back a long ways, probably longer than we really want to, to say at this point. That's right. And I, I will admit, I'm really excited to chat with you today because through all the years that we've worked together, you know, the one thing I remember is you were always very well known for your communication style, your communication skills. And I believe the first time I heard the word bifurcate came from you. And I believe this is attributed to you at one time talking about the ever changing and evolving business unit that we were part of. You compared it, used the analogy of the shifting continents in Pangea you know, coming all together and spreading apart and and coming back together. (laughs) So really excited to get your perspective, your take, especially with your background in communications and how you've really leveraged it throughout your career and really with what you're doing now in the education training technology space, focusing in on frontline workers and getting them better skilled to adapt new technology and software that their organizations are rolling out to them. Yep. So, from that perspective, when, when you hear the term communication skills or that somebody is a great or a strong communicator, what comes to mind for you? Yeah, and you sort of began to answer it in the question. I'll, I'll tell your audience a funny story about bifurcate. We had a boss who asked me privately that, is that word like a bodily function? I had to explain to him that it was not. So um, uh, you learn something every day. So <clears throat> I think how I'm going to answer that, I wrote some notes down. And you, you explained why I think I'm going to say this is the number one thing I think of when I hear communication skills is how do I and my message become memorable? Um, it is so difficult to be memorable today. People are inundated. We know the statistics of the, the, the tens of thousands of marketing messages we get, plus the communication from family members, friends, stakeholders in our lives, things of that nature, the inner voices that we probably all have talking to us constantly. Um, it's hard to 
escape that. And it's hard to remember much of any of it. It just sort of comes and goes and, and turns into this mush. And so, you know, you and I, having been in roles that involve sales and business development, there's the great adage that 90% of salespeople are 100% uh, forgettable. I would argue that 90% of all communication is 100% forgettable. And so I'm always, con uh, uh, I'm always sensitive to how can I, in a professional way, not glitzing it up with a bunch of, 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 you know, sizzle that that's all they remember. What are they, how they remember the meat of the message? How do I become memorable? So we'll talk about that this, the, today on this conversation. And I think the other piece is succinct. Um, this is a struggle for me. And I think it's a struggle for most people is to be succinct in our communication. People will remember things that are succinct. That doesn't mean short or too short. It just means tight. It means that there's not a lot of fluff in there. And I, I think it was the, the great Mark Twain that said, if I had more time, I would have written fewer words or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a boss and a mentor <coughs> one time actually use an analogy with me. And he said, you know, think gross, that's fine, but write net or speak net. And I never forgot that. I thought that was a great way to explain it because you have all these ideas floating around, but there's a way to synthesize it that is succinct, crisp, and ideally memorable. So when I hear communication skills, those are two things I go to, and they're two things to really, really focus on. And they're not easy, but if you get them right, you'll probably succeed. Couldn't agree more. And I love the point about being memorable. There mm -hmm. is, as you mentioned, so much coming at us every day. You know, a lot of the folks listening to this, their inbox is just fills up overnight, fills up all throughout the day, personal stuff, work stuff the text messages, the Facebook, the Instagram notifications, things that are still coming in the mail. We're getting you know inundated with messages. And so it really is important to, in a meaningful way, stand out, make your message memorable. So fr from your perspective, what are a couple of ways that you really can make sure that the message you're getting across is memorable? Yeah, I, I think these sound pretty basic, but I think word choice matters. Um, it's so easy to, to have the crutch of platitudes or cliches or <clears throat> generic words that could mean 10 things. And I'll even challenge myself sometimes when I go back through my communications and go, I'm applying what I infer to be true when I read that. But if I were to remove that filter and actually read it blind, right? Read it like an end user who's not inside my head that word I said could be taken five different ways. And <clears throat> that happens a lot. We speak in a lot of cliches. I'm sure I'll use more today than I, than I even would even want to, uh, both on this conversation and in my, my job. Um, be, so, so word choice matters. I think another thing, uh, we could talk about this more later too, but you know, things like humor, little, little quips, th things that bring levity or that bring authenticity or realism, those are memorable too, because so much communication today is highly uh, processed, manufactured, uh, inauthentic, wooden, and that you kind of see that for what it is. I mean, I challenge an average listener, pick up a press release and just take a highlighter and highlight all the generic business language in there, and then roll your eyes and say, if you took this out, what does this actually mean, right? And, uh, you know, I got to challenge myself on that because we all, the more we're in the business world, speak that language of streamline this and circle back that and take it to the next level this and strike while the iron's hot. Those are all fine. But if you just stack one on top of the other, if you actually unpack that, you haven't said anything. You haven't been memorable. I don't know what it is you're actually saying. I could take strike while the iron's hot to mean one thing and you meant something else. It's just a lazy, it's just a lazy approach to communication. So the intentionality of your communication is really critical. A lot of people just kind of dump whatever the first thing comes in their mind. And I have seen really good communicators painstakingly think through that um, if time allows, because that's how you become memorable and you stand out and you don't leave anything to interpretation. Definitely. You know, the idea of word choice matters. That's really important. And you know, to be clear with your language, but sometimes using a word like bifurcate, it works in the sense that it gets people's attention. People are like, 
what does that mean? And you're, so you're going to grab it, whether it's in a, a speech or presentation that you're giving or on a conference call and a message that's going out. Sometimes the word choice using a relatively unknown word may pique people's interest, kind of get them a little bit more engaged. The idea of being intentional. And I, I love what you said about authenticity when it comes to, especially when you're trying to motivate your audience, trying to you know drive adoption for something or get people engaged. If they're just hearing all this corporate speak, the corporate jargon, it's just, it's not you. It's, it's ran through legal so many times. It's ran through marketing, PR, everything. Yep. You're not getting who they realize that disconnect between the message they're receiving and the person who sent it. So I do believe so much so that it is really important to be authentic with, with what you're saying and try to instill your personality into it, whether it be through humor or quips or really whatever you are. I, you know, I, I do encourage people that if you're not a quote funny person or not known for being that person to be cautious when you try to infuse humor, because a lot of times it does go awry, but yeah. make it your own, right? Infuse your personality into it. Absolutely. So as, as you're thinking of you know, the skills needed for success in, in business today, with your career leading you know, sales, management, leading teams of hundreds and hundreds of people, you even now working in you know, the, the tech space that's focusing on frontline workers, what are some of the skills, communication skills specifically that, that you're seeing are <coughs> crucial or critical today? Yeah, and it kind of bridges back to what we just said, but this idea of sense making, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in the middle of technology now and, and I'm kind of in my first real capital T technology, you know, centric role, not IT. Uh, you do not want me in IT. I'm the reason IT has uh, a lot of jobs. But technology, there's so much disruption, so much emerging, so much, uh, such a short life cycle, right? And I, I don't want to be narrow if you're thinking, oh, I'm not in technology. We're all in technology. We're all in technology, whether you think you work for a technology company or not. If your company is not digitally transforming in some regard, I would look for another company because they're not going to be around long. So, um, you know, even the most basic, you know, jobs of mankind like uh, farming are digitizing. I listened today to a podcast. They're literally putting uh, virtual reality goggles on cows, honest to goodness, and they look like they're in beautiful green pastures and they're producing more and better milk. I could not believe it. I almost ran off the road listening to this. True story. <laughs> so, so even farming is, is adopting technology. So what I say is, in communicating technology, your value proposition internally, if you're in a job that's internal or externally to the marketplace or in management, is this idea of sense making, you know, solving problems. Ideally, communication is to solve a problem. Um, I don't know something, you know something, I don't. I need to articulate something you don't know, right? Think about the problem that exists that compels communication. One of those talking to talk. Other than my seven year old, no one's just talking to talk. Um, she does, but we're, we're solving a problem through communication. So identify what it is you're trying to solve that would inform the communication. Uh, and people don't think at that level typically. <coughs> they just articulate whatever it is they've got on their mind <coughs> or the way they see it or the way they understand it because that's the best way they know how to articulate it. Hey, that made sense to me. But if you can understand the receiver of that communication, that's going to be powerful. And, and, and this this idea of personalized communication, again, communication could be one-to-one, one-to-many. You might know the person, you might not. To the extent you can personalize the communication in an authentic way, you have a much higher chance of, at minimum, getting the empathy <coughs> from the receiver to have the curiosity to follow up that they don't understand. Because the worst thing that can happen is you imply something, they infer something else. It's not what you want them to infer, but they don't tell you that it's not what you want them to infer. They they infer that they got it or don't care enough to follow up. So if the personalization is there, the empathy is there to say, wait a minute, you said this, did you mean this or this? Now that takes effort on behalf of the receiver mm -hmm. and you wanna earn that effort through trust, credibility, authenticity, whatever it might be. If that happens, those are great things. Um, you see this happening <laughs> with social listening with companies, right? If you're on Twitter, now they don't they don't engage the trolls and the bad actors, um, but they'll talk about authentic questions or authentic 
confusion based on a message in social media. So you'll see the account of an airline or the account of a consumer products company engage and say, did you mean this or this? Or how can I help you, right? The empathy is there. The personalization is there. Hey, they they reached out. They had 100 replies. They, had, they, they wanted my, my input. That's huge. So as you think about communicating with customers, and that could be an internal customer, an external customer, a stakeholder, having that in place is a huge skill to getting it right. Because you might not get it right with the first communication, but if that personalization is there, they might be able to empathize and, and get it right. Excellent. Yeah, there are a couple couple key things there that you hit on that, that really interest me. You know, one is this idea of, of customers, internal, external customer. And I think oftentimes when the word customer comes up, people just simply think of that consumer transaction. I'm at the store, I'm buying something, I'm their customer, or whether it's a B2B customer. But quite, quite honestly, all of us, if you're working, you have customers, regardless if you're a client facing or customer facing right. position. If you're in IT, you're in, in data science, you're whatever, uh, you, you have internal customers, those people that you're <laughs> supporting, you're providing your work output to those are your customers. So being able to effectively communicate with them. And really the thing that, I, that jumped out to me that you said is this idea of communication really is about problem solving. And I never thought about that that way before, but in essence, if you think of just about any communication that you have, you're solving a problem. You're sending out an invite to your kid's birthday party, right? Okay, the problem is we have this party coming up. We want to make sure there's kids, kids there so that my kid has fun. You're trying to solve for that. You're sending something out to a client. I don't have enough sales. I don't have enough revenue. You're trying to solve for that problem. So I think it's important that when you're sending communications out, Think through that lens of what problem am I trying to solve? What, or another way to frame it is, what am I trying to accomplish with this message? And then from there, you touched on the audience. Who's this going to? Is this going to the executive, the CEO of my company? Is this going to you know, a peer? Is this going to someone on my team that, that reports up to me? Or is it going to a broad audience with multiple levels and figure out how do you structure that message for the audience, you know, likely the CEO of the company is not going to read a long five page dissertation email about something. They're going to want the point right up front. What's the, what's the key message? What do you need me to do? And, you know, we do a lot here with training folks, how to write in that style of get your message out there. First and foremost, this is what I want you to do. And then you can provide all the details and evidence if that's important to that person to read or somebody else in that message. So no, those are kind of great, great, concepts to think about when it comes to communication, right? Am I solving problems or what problem am I solving? Am I thinking about it from a customer centric standpoint, whether it's an internal or external customer, and then really trying to personalize that message for them. So no, that's fantastic. I have found that that's an effective bridge for people that would see themselves as introverts. Because if you're an extrovert, you love to communicate anyway. Mm -hmm. Sometimes an introvert likes to tinker and solve problems and work on things and not as, as much engage with people. So if you take what they like to do, which is solve problems and apply it to the thing communication where maybe they have trepidation about, they take the skills to solve a problem, they apply it there. So if you're naturally, if you're listening to this and you're naturally what you would think is an introvert or not a great communicator, not a great public speaker, that's fine. Think about a solving a problem and apply those principles to your communication. You might be surprised you're a better communicator than you give yourself credit for. Love it. Love it. And you, you myself, I, a lot of people don't realize this or things, but I, I consider myself to be, be an introvert. I'm, I'm quite an introverted person, but as I go through my, my communications, it is. I have a, a process that I go through. I kind of figure out what am I trying to accomplish? And then if I apply it to that, it gets me into that comfort zone where I do feel good, you know, having these conversations or getting up in front of an audience because I've done the preparation and kind of gone through my process and definitely not somebody that's going to wing it, so to speak, when giving a speech or meeting with a client or something like that. So I really love that scenario of if you're an introvert, here's kind of how you can apply this to your yeah. work or personal interactions. Yeah. So Jason, if you think about your career journey and the success that you've had What's maybe one or two of the skills, kind of these communication skills that really stand out to you that, you know, this is what helped take me to the next level or to move within my organization or to really just kind of have this type of career set success? Yeah, I jotted a couple of things down. You know, some of it started really young. Um, you know, 
people, and I think an affectionate way, tease me about my vocabulary. You, you use the bifurcate example. I think if, if you're going to tease me about something and it's my vocabulary, I've done pretty well. Um, <laughs> I, I would say I'm, I'm erudite, right? As to <laughs> use the joke. But, you know, I had a vocabulary book given to me in like sixth, seventh grade as part of my like advanced English arts. Uh, I definitely did more advanced in English arts and, and those areas than math and science. That was not where I excelled. And I look back and I probably, some of these words I probably were exposed to a lot younger than maybe a person would be. <laughs> and so I will challenge you out there, no matter what career stage you're in, is as silly as that sounds, learn your taxonomy and elevate it because people do remember that stuff. And you don't want to be, you know, pompous and 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 pious and all those kinds of things. But there, there's ways to use words to your point where you're not the only person, Scott, that has said to me, Jason, you said this word, I'd never heard it. It made sense. I looked it up. Now it really makes sense. It connected a dot for them, but I intrigued them, right? And I think probably I had credibility to do that because I wasn't describing the word out of thin air. It was maybe a better word, just not as well known to articulate to solve that communication problem that I had. So I think just get your vocabulary where it needs to be. And there's skills and tools, particularly today with the internet. There was no internet when I was in sixth grade, right? So these were physical tools. Uh, I think your ability to build a storytelling skill set. I would say if you're a good storyteller, you're a good communicator. Again, it goes back to those memorable things, right? Analogies, things of that nature. I tend as a big sports guy to use probably too many sports analogies. So I've worked to, to, to broaden that. But people will stop me in an airport that they see me after a long time or on a catch-up call after 10 years and say, I still remember when you said blah, blah, blah. And I will do that to people that have influenced my career too. So effective analogies that really, really make sense. I mean, if you think about ancient writings, biblical and other scholarly and religious writings, they use analogies. This has mm -hmm. always been how mankind has related uh, abstract ideas to, to new ideas or things, and it just clicks. So I love, love analogies when they are spot on. I love sharing them. I love seeing light bulbs go off other, over other people's heads, and I love listening to them and getting them and stealing them. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. when appropriate. So um, I know people have stolen my stuff. So no, no, all's fair in love and war. And I, I steal other people's analogies when it makes sense. Uh, I talked about humor. And I think the other thing is, is adaptability. Um, you know, we had an old, we had an old colleague that used to say up, down, sideways in your communication, right. And also internal, external. So tailoring your communication to the audience is huge. And I think if you're just a one trick pony and this is how I communicate, take it or leave it, you're going to have limited effectiveness. But if you are knowledgeable that, hey, my boss <clears throat> probably needs 10% of what I got, let's be tight. My direct report might need 50% more than I have because they might be junior to the role, new to the company, less experienced, whatever it might be. Um, if you're in a management role, if you're a junior and you're looking to manage sideways, understand what that could look like. So just don't take a one size approach uh, to communication. Again, we talked about personalization. We talked about customizing, but having that adaptability to take and receive communication in different settings, I think will make you more versatile as a communicator and probably more marketable as a professional and maybe a leader if that's where you want to go. I think over the past 24 months, the, the folks who have been adaptable in, in a number of aspects, but especially in their communication styles and their methods have, have seen much more success and probably a lot more happiness uh, than those who don't. And you know, the idea of if I was used to being in person with my team all day, every day, and now everyone's at home and we can only work through the phone or work through Zoom or something like this, there's maybe a lot more written communication. If I haven't been able to effectively adapt that style, I'm going to struggle. And I like how you position this idea of, of adapting the message you receive for, once again, that intended audience. And I remember years ago, you going through a training, this concept came up of if you have this long email chain, don't just forward it on to your boss, your higher up with an FYI dot, 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 right? They aren't going to necessarily have the time to read through that chain. So understand who's the audience, provide a two or three sentence summary. Hey, for your information, here's what this is all about. No action needed. Yep. You're just kind of using, figuring out where's this going, what might they need, or what are some of the key points of that? And I just love that you hit on storytelling. We hear this quite a bit from our clients. Stories are so powerful. And as you mentioned, throughout time, that's how people have communicated through stories and analogies and taking 
kind of disparate, disconnected things and bringing them together through story. And you know, we both have worked with some amazing storytellers you know, throughout our career. And I, you know, I kicked it off kind of talking about the example that you had used before with, with how our business unit was changing and evolving. Yep. So they really do help kind of make the, the spark happen or the light bulb go off, so to speak, when sometimes people just aren't getting it when you're tactically going through That's what's right. going on. So I, I really encourage folks that are listening, practice storytelling, build your network with people who are good storytellers. You yep. know, if you work with some folks or have people at you know organizations you're involved with, with your neighbors that are great at that, they always have some sort of way to explain something. Spend yep. time with them. Pick up on that. You may not may not necessarily be able to copy exactly their stories. You can kind of take the premise and adapt them to what you're doing because it will have a big impact on your results. Yes. Yeah. Can I make a 30 second soapbox too on adaptability with Zoom and and this new work from home remote culture? Absolutely. This idea that I don't need to turn on my camera because I don't look camera ready or whatever. Um, I'm going to call BS on that. Um, if you were at the office, you would be camera ready. And I don't know a meeting where if you're internal or external, if you were in the office and say, listen, I'm going to go under the table and we can talk. Um, I don't want to be viewed by you right now. That wouldn't go over well. So I'm going to challenge you. If you want to be a successful communicator, um, short of having a, le a level of sickness that you probably wouldn't be working anyway, or you're literally in a place where it's distracting, get on camera and no one expects people to be, you know, Hollywood ready anymore. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, I won't disclose what I'm wearing other than this shirt, right? But it's uh, done match. Um, so, you know, it's okay. We get it. And we're all doing it. And what I would say is uh, the nonverbal that happens on Zoom, my ability to kind of follow this conversation, seeing you and seeing your nonverbals and vice versa, this is a pleasant light conversation. If it was an intense conversation, a one-on-one, -on -one, an important strategy discussion, you got to do that stuff. The benefit of this is here. So I don't get the Zoom fatigue thing. Maybe mm -hmm. it's just because, Scott, I did it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm empathetic to a point, but just be mindful that we're not hiding behind that. There's probably a reason you want to be off camera. Maybe you're multitasking. Maybe you're, mm -hmm. you know, doing something you shouldn't be doing or somewhere you shouldn't be. But if you want to be a good communicator, you got to be visible. There are times where I'll be on camera and the other person isn't. And I'll still be on camera because yeah. I want to set that expectation. I might be pitching them. I might be talking to them. And it's weird because I'm talking to a screen, but I want them to see me. I know my message will come across. So mm -hmm be on camera whenever you can, it makes a difference. Well, it's, it's good practice too. It's you know, for, for that when you really need to be on camera for something, you, you've gone through, you flex those muscles, you've used those skills a good bit. The thing that I would say to that is be conscious of when it needs to be a Zoom call versus when it needs to be a five minute pick up the phone. I think that's, that's right. what I think what's feeding into some of the Zoom fatigue is that everyone's constantly you're setting up video calls where it may not necessarily could have just been a quick phone call. And that's on, quite honestly <laughs> for meetings in general, right? Even before yeah. this, when it was an in-person meeting, so, okay, the old adage of this meeting could have been an email, you know, just understand, you know, is this really a quote meeting or is this a phone call? And that's a whole nother conversation of skills that people you know, need to develop around how to lead, lead effective meetings and quite honestly, determine whether or not it needs to be a meeting in and of itself. So yep. absolutely. Yep. Well, you know, we've hit on this a, a little bit. You've mentioned a few times, you know, you, people who have influenced you and folks that you have worked with throughout your career. So if you think of somebody from, you know, throughout your experiences, and you don't necessarily need to name names if you don't want to, but, you know, has there been somebody that you've really, you know, stolen from or they've influenced your communication style to kind of where you are today? Yeah, I'll answer this a little bit differently and that I'll challenge everyone to, because yes, there certainly is, but I would say take something from everybody because I, I when, when thinking about this question, so many people came to mind for various reasons. You know, one person taught me to be more direct and candid, less flowery, less verbose. Mm -hmm. Other people taught me to be more succinct, right? Tighter, crisper. Other people taught me to tamp down my natural enthusiasm in certain settings because maybe my affectation, there's a word you can look up if you don't know it, my affectation was inappropriate in that setting. Whereas in other settings, 
uh, maybe settings down into my team, it was perfect because they needed that juice for me, mm-hmm. but maybe a, a stuffier, more senior environment politefully didn't. And I would come off as uh, maybe immature. I, I was promoted young. And so I was kind of in, in big roles early in my career. I was very fortunate for that, but I had to be mindful of that youth dynamic and not to bring too much youthful naivety or exuberance into rooms where you came off as, you know, the, the naive kid, right. Or the Pollyanna. So everyone kind of taught me along the way and continues to today. I, I learned from my new boss in this technology company. I report to the CEO and he's been in this space for 20 years. And so Mm -hmm. what he's forgotten is more than I'll never know, but I'm learning things daily, but it's great that I can bring things to the company, bring things to him, bring things to my colleagues from my career as well. So be mindful. You, if you're, if your antenna is up, you can pick something up from everyone. And like any other area of life, if you had good parents, bad parents, good teachers, bad teachers, learn from all of it. Learn from the poor communicators. Learn from the communicators that were selfish or that were curt or that lacked empathy or that never took the time to know you and say, that'll never be me. You know, learn that. Those are just as powerful as the good examples. Spot on. I, I was going to, if you didn't say that, I was going to add that in this idea of learn from everyone really truly is learn from everyone, the good, bad, the ugly. And <coughs> you know, throughout my career, I've been very fortunate to have some amazing leaders and some not so much, but regardless of if I you know didn't work well with that person or just didn't feel I was getting a lot from them, I was learning. As you mentioned, the antenna was up. I was picking up on things so that, okay, when I'm in this position or when I have this opportunity, here's how I would probably do it differently and, and, and just learn from that. So pick up the good things, pick up things maybe you shouldn't do, and then you apply it all together. And that's why it's so important to engage, to have a network, to have an audience, try not to just be siloed, head down, doing your work, because every time you engage with somebody, you have an opportunity to learn, pick something right. up new, a new strategy, new vocabulary word, whatever it may be that you can start to incorporate into your repertoire, so to speak, uh, to be a more engaging, more effective communicator, and ultimately, you know, ideally advance your career. So absolutely. Yep. yep, agreed. All right, so I want to be be respectful of your time, Jason. Here, you know, as we wrap up, any closing thoughts or last tidbits you may have for somebody, whether they are you know, a junior person, maybe they are similar to you, having a lot of success early on in their career, or in some you know big roles early on, or maybe they're mid career making a, a pivot into something different, any last minute thoughts or closing advice you would have for them? Sure. A couple things uh, <clears throat> that I jotted down, you know, number one, communication is a skill. It's something you can practice. It's something you can improve. Um, we can all get better if, if the effort is there. So if you, if, if you're not sure if you're a good communicator, and even if you think you are, don't stop practicing. And, and, you know, I talked at the beginning of the conversation, you know, it, 19 years old, I'm on the radio uh, analyzing the first half of a college basketball game or writing, you know, uh, for a daily newspaper that had a a, a decent reach. And, you know, there was nerves with that or speaking publicly. I think I was always (coughs) drawn to those opportunities and it wasn't this debilitating fear where it's like rivaling the fear of death or anything like it does for people. But I will say to you, if you want to be a good communicator, never turn those opportunities down. You, you might crash and burn, you might struggle, you might muddle your way through it, but it's reps, it's reps, it's practice. And you'd be surprised that you start stacking reps on top of each other that you get better if you practice it. So that's one piece. The second, I would say, particularly to the younger generation, you know, you know, you and I are at a level uh, or a generation where we remember a world without emojis and without Twitter and without some of the sort of shorthand communication that's taken over communication. But I would say that as I work with younger professionals, they don't know what formal communication looks like. And that is still a thing in the business world. And I would say that all the C-U-Z for cuz and the the emojis and all of that, you might be articulating a message in a peer environment or a social casual environment, but I see the word cause in formal business communication when people mean to say because, they just write cause. Now, spell check won't pick that up because right. C-A-U-S-E is a, is a word. We found it in some marketing material this week. So that's where practice your formal communication and ask to see formal communications. Ask to see business proposals. Read things like annual reports of publicly traded companies. Read things that are, that are polished <coughs> and that are tight 
that are professional communications because you got to know what that looks like if all you ever see is twitter and text and emojis that is communication and it's a part of communication for sure and i have emojis with my employees and and colleagues all the time to articulate things so i'm not above that mm -hmm. but also know what professional communication looks like and then i think again just consume all kinds of communication consume podcasts uh, like this and others consume press releases and cr scrutinize them and consume uh, articles and, and peer-reviewed papers consume everything across the gamut you'll be amazed at what you pick up with vocabulary ideas ways to organize thoughts and take a critical eye to say that's terrible that's loaded with jargon or i wouldn't have said that or oh gosh here's another one of those you'll start to spot that stuff and again learn from everything learn what to do and learn what not to do love it and i think it boils down to to the two things practice which is so important getting those reps but going along with that is knowing what to practice making sure that you're practicing effectively so combined with practice is the consumption learning understand yeah if you're reading 10ks you're reading press releases you're going to pick up on the the more polished professional ways to communicate and then you can incorporate that and practice as you're doing it in your day to day and the yep. way that i think about it is if i went out to the driving range every day and was just hitting bucket after bucket after bucket of balls i might get a smidge better but unless I'm watching videos around proper technique, swing technique, how to hold the club to turn the face in and out, or maybe I had a coach, or I was just you know, reading a lot or playing with somebody much better than me, I'm not going to see that much improvement. So this idea of practice combined with the knowledge is what will make the difference. Yeah, you brought golf up. So I'll say at the end, you know, Tiger Woods had a great quote. He says, you know, amateurs practice until they get it right. Professionals practice until they cannot get it wrong. So when it comes to communication, what are you, right? Are you an amateur or a professional? And, and the amount of time you put into practicing and honing that will tell you where you land there. Perfect, Jay, I think that is a great place to wrap it up for the day. Jason, thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it and you sharing your, your thoughts and expertise. Have a great day. Thank you, Scott. A special thanks again to my guest, Jason Lyons from Skillful. For me, a few takeaways. The idea of word choice matters and working on your vocabulary. Focus on adaptability because as times change or we go through major changes at an organization or simply as a society as a whole, those who are adaptable typically come out ahead. And really the importance of storytelling. Stories are such a great tool to help get your point across and to help connect the dots for people. And one big thing that really jumped out to me is this idea of take something from everybody. Every interaction you have, you have the opportunity to learn something, whether it may be something you should do, something you shouldn't do, but take something from everybody. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you have not already, please subscribe to Communicast so that you'll be notified when a new episode comes out. Thanks and have a great day.